I've traded in, yeah, I've traded in my jeans. Like I'm never going to touch them again. I'm just like sweat life for life. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I am wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's get started. So uh, thanks, Sarah, for joining us today. We'd love to love to have you in kind of our kickoff of this um, kind of blogger focused version of Yeah, Highlight. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And so that that's actually the um, the story I was going to tell is, you know, we've been we've been running Highlighter as a as a place for reading on the web and a place that we all gather and read books and highlight and annotate the books together. Um, and it's just been such a great way for us to connect with people who have common interests and common reading. Um, but we've been very focused on traditional authors. And so there was a dinner that Boris and his partner Angela hosted several years ago in Soma. And I bumped into Sarah there. And Sarah said, okay, I get the book stuff, but she's like, you know what? What you really need to do is web highlighting. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, we, we like that. That's, that's an interesting area too. And so it kind of reminded me, I don't know if this is dating myself, but uh, the, there was this movie, The Graduate, and there's that, that guy who says, plastics. <laughs> it's like the, the, uh, the area of the future is plastics. And so Sarah was that person advising me. She said, you know, web highlighting. <laughs> and so it's appropriate that we have Sarah here with us today as a blogger, and as a writer online, and sort of as a person who has written stuff that we like to highlight and discuss and come together. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank I would you have felt, for joining us. I would have felt more proud of that moment if it had happened in like 1994 or something. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still an unsolved problem. We're still, yes. uh, still going to crack away at it and, and, and chip, that, chip away at it bit by bit. Uh, so the, uh, the general format here is town hall. So everybody's welcome to participate. I know we've got a bunch of you know, friendly faces and people who've been to these before. So feel free to chime in. Everybody's done their pre-reading, I'm sure. Uh, and we wanna just keep it, get, get all your questions and get a chance to, to talk to Sarah and, and ask your questions. Um, one of the things I will mention is we, um, we are streaming out to YouTube and we're recorded. And so what we're gonna do is produce a video of the session today so that we can all watch it later. People who couldn't make it um, can continue to learn from all of the, the knowledge and, and wisdom that, uh, that Sarah shares with us tonight. Uh, yeah. And hopefully this is a super open discussion, like really not fireside chat. I know we're all sick of those. So please feel free to chime in and um, use the chat liberally. And that goes for Sarah too. So Sarah, feel free to lob questions back at us or kind of pick on people right. as well in the spirit of getting everyone involved. Um, yeah, so I have prepared nothing. Perfect. I have a blank slate, so. That's what we like. So we're good. But yeah, if you all wanna say where you're calling from on chat, we can kind of use that to say hi as we're kicking off. To actually, you know, kind of to kick off overall, you know, one of the things we always love to do is learn about the writing process. And so, mm. you know, I know Sarah, you've, you've done kind of a bunch of writing on Medium and you're on Twitter a bit here and there. And I just wonder, how do you think about how writing kind of as a process? Do you write when you're inspired? Do you have a goal? How do you, how do you think about it? How does it fit into your life? I find that I have two, uh, two categories of writing. I actually tweeted about this because I worried about it for this presentation. My best writing is when I have like an insight and it, I sit down and 30 minutes later, I'm ready to press publish. Like mm -hmm. those are the posts that I feel most strike a chord. And then I'm sure we've all had the experience of, of, of when you're writing something and it's actually its own process of discovery of figuring out what the insight is itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll, like I started working on this marketplace framework, uh, actually kind of November, December of last year. And there were, it, it started off as a port almost of my engagement hierarchy, but I had like by the, by, by like V1, it was four levels and I had split buyers by side and the sell side. And it was this complex, you know, monstrosity that didn't mm -hmm. make any sense. And, and then it was a process of like, tr you know, peeling and peeling the onion, I guess you could say, and not knowing, honestly, like I, there were times when I was working on this where I just didn't know if I would ever ship it. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't know if I would ever get, and like, I have so many, like, if you looked at my drafts and my oh, yeah. medium, I have so <laughs> many of those where like, I don't know if I'm going to actually get to the end of it. Right. Um, 
And so I, I worry, you know, for the ones that are like that, I worry about, you know, I, I probably learn the most from them, but I worry about them because you just put so much energy into it. And then it, you know, you don't know if you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And you always start with kind of that blank page on medium or like in, in this case, there's some slides from a deck, I guess, is that a talk that you had given that you kind of poured it into this format or? Yeah, what well, I had given a talk, um, for uh, this near Eyal engagement summit, oh, yeah. and and that and I created a hierarchy of engagement um, where I was just synthesizing my own learnings and uh, building product at Pinterest, mm -hmm. um, and then I I just was like, okay, well I did this, I might as well publish it, and it really resonated, and then that's I you know I started to think, well, what would this look like for transactional businesses, marketplaces in particular? And that was mm -hmm. a thought that's been on my mind for honestly a couple of years. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just never, you know, it took me a while to get to it. Right. And you end up having a lot of back and forth refining the ideas in public once it's published or does it kind of like live as a piece on its own? So I did two things. One is I had a, for this one, I had a group of people that I like, I met with and presented it and like iterated, you know, got their feedback, tried to understand what wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. Then I, I actually published a version of it in my rough drafts uh, newsletter. Mm -hmm. And I got some amazing feedback there from people of, of like what was unclear and not clear. And then I finally, you know, published it. But even now, like I have a next version that I'm going to be rolling out at some point. Um, with like a small tweak to it that I think will help clarify. So it's, I, I think of it as a living, a living breathing document that I imagine a couple years from now will look different than it looks now. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's the magic of the internet, right? Yes. Well, it's, you know, it's a hard thing also, like you put a version out and, and I was, I was more nervous to publish this one than I was a high, my first one because the first one, like, it, you know, it, it, uh, I had less followers, honestly, and, and there was something that felt like I knew it was going to have an impact. I hoped mm -hmm. it would have an impact. People would read it and then make decisions based on it. And so I was more scared about getting it more right. Mm -hmm. And then if I do a new, a new version, it's kind of like, what's that? Uh, the truth, you know, the, uh, a lie goes around the world, you know, five times before the truth has a chance oh, right. to put its pants on. Like <laughs> there's a little bit of like, if I do an update to it, it won't get the same readership, honestly, as the first right. version. So it really created a higher bar for the first version. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In terms of actually like thinking about how this framework evolves into the future. And even now, one thing that I was very curious about is like a lot of our town hall guests, like Elad, Sarah Fryer from Bloomberg, everyone's talking about this kind of rebirth of consumer social right now in particular. Yep. And I am super curious to see how you're thinking about applying some of the principles in your framework to consumer social and the sort of new age we're seeing coming up. Particularly like, we could even just start with why now? Like, why is this the moment mm -hmm. we're seeing all these things? What's not working? Like sure. I think it's called incumbent social experiences kind of isolating in another interview. So yeah. like what's broken and what might be appealing as a result? I, I think there's two big things happening right now. Um, I wrote another post about this, but actually this is another post that was one of the like, whoo, takes 30 mm -hmm. minutes to write. Um, where I, I, I you know, a, the biggest thing that's happening right now is that the things that we used to spend our time doing that used to take a big amount of our time, we can't do anymore. All the offline things. So. And, and it's more extreme in California, you know, for what it's worth, but still it's like, we don't, we can't go to movies. We can't go to restaurants. We can't hang out. We don't, we're not going on vacations. Like we're not, you know, going to sport. Like there's just so like, think about all those offline activities. And if, and if you, if you, if you kind of imagine you have 24 hours in a day and, and you used to fill that day, I think of it as like a cup with like, you know, uh, these types of things, they don't exist anymore. And it means that you have all this other time that's free. And it's like a new, a new race to kind of grab those minutes. Um, and, when, and, and so you, what you see is that like uh, a lot of the social experiences 
that already exist are having kind of record engagement. Their advertising revenue might be down because of the general economy, but like engagement has never been higher. But it also means that new experiences like Clubhouse and others now have an opportunity to grab minutes that didn't used to be up for grabs and used to have more competition for. Um, and that's creating this like new rebirth uh, in, so in social and consumer. Uh, the second thing is then what you were alluding to, which was another one of my posts, which is that a lot of the incumbent social experiences are what I kind of think of as like this lean back experience where you're going through a feed of someone else's content and it doesn't make you feel good about yourself and you're not really engaging with it. And the stuff that I think is kind of the future of social will look more like a game, will look more participatory in how people engage with it. Um, Cause that's actually what makes people feel better about themselves when they do social. Um, and so I think you're seeing a confluence of those two things right now that are creating a real why now um, that's very different than usual. Usually it's like a new device, you know, or a new distribution channel, but, um, but we're in a different, we're in a very different time right now. With that, um, I was also wondering about what you think about kind of these experiences unbundling into more niche communities. Like you want to go somewhere to talk about movies or you want to go somewhere to talk about like venture and tech, maybe people yeah. are using Clubhouse for that. How are you thinking about like this unbundling phenomenon and is it sort of cyclical? Like do yeah, you have cyclical. unbundling to rebundling? Where are we in that? Yeah, there's, what's that expression? There's only two ways to make money, bundling and unbundling. Right. <laughs> um, and so, uh, oh, gosh, I, I was just talking with someone about this yesterday. But they were talking about bundling something I can't even remember. But, um, but yeah, it's, you know, it, it, it's so like, depending on what experience you're looking at, it's going to be a different, uh, a different phenomenon. So like, will LinkedIn get unbundled? Craigslist has been unbundled, like people have been unbundling it for a while. Um, there, but there are some example I want to give you, I can't remember of actually bundling happening. Um, I've got, I've got one that's a little more Please, modern. Yeah. Is, uh, I think there was a bundle of Twitter. Twitter is a bundle of content. Yeah. And then Substack is a version of unbundling of some of that. And then what Nathan Bachez is doing with everything is kind of a rebundling of the that's unbundling. That's a great example. That's so it a has a really example. nice, you know, very modern and kind of touches on two of yeah. those things that are almost like each a bundle and unbundle that are new. <laughs> yeah. Almost yeah, I'd be curious if other out. people have yeah, I think that's a great example. There's there's one example that uh, I've been sort of experiencing in my own life. Uh, I've been using um, this note-taking app called Rome. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, and it's basically like all of my to-do lists have now. So I was using Todoist, and now that's in here. Uh, I was using Evernote, and now that's in here. I was using, um, you know, Readwise and Instapaper, and like I still use them for one thing, but they basically end up in one place. So I kind of have seen all of these productivity apps that I've been using ending up in one place, which has been interesting. That's, uh, I think that's a great example. I, I haven't feel, been able to pr get into Rome personally, but I'm trying. I'm, I'm curious yes. if Rome is actually an interesting example because it's so like productivity focused. And Sarah, in your pieces on marketplaces, you talk about like, you know, the focus for the starting mm -hmm. point. And I wonder, mm -hmm. Will, do you think a productivity tool could ever end up being an initial focus point that could broaden to like a consumer social or will, is productivity one thing or is it, does it work as a thimble or a wedge? Yeah. Uh, Rome actually, it, you know, it's super interesting. Rome is, I, they, I think Connor, the CEO would describe it as like, like um, I shouldn't put words in his mouth, but like a knowledge management tool mm -hmm. and, and where his thimble, his like, constrained problem that that where he got some real leverage in the beginning was actually the kind of um i think it's like the stanford ai like research groups mm -hmm. you know and 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 academia so like kind of intense deep learning engineering yeah. like really hard knowledge management problems and then you kind of saw a lot of it happening in academia too and and using that as like the place where you have that red hot center 
And then knowledge, you know, the wonderful thing about knowledge is that it is this expansive thing and that someone who might be working with using Roam for a particular utility can then very easily kind of just find the horizontal ability of it to just to, to kind of um, keep bringing them into to broader use cases. So I think it's a great, a great example. It actually relates a little bit to something that Mishti was referring to, which is like, you know, the thinking, the more you think about marketplaces, you, the more you realize that the, the training of thinking about marketplaces applies to like really everything. Like mm -hmm. Rome right now is basically a SaaS product. I mean, it's a SaaS, it's a, it's a software as a service, really single player mode product, but you can, you know, you, you see what they've done and, and the depth of features that they build in order to accommodate that, that use case. Um, user generated sites, you know, I think about UGC as, you know, any social product really, we have the supply side, the content mm -hmm. creators and the demand side, which is the viewers. And it just happens to be that the supply side also is 100%, you know, viewers, but not the other way around. Mm -hmm. But you, when you start thinking about it that way, you just, you do a lot of the same lessons of thinking about marketplaces apply to starting a social product or an open source project or a SaaS product. Mm -hmm. And those are, I guess, what focusing on these very specific niches, like the Stanford AI community exactly. would be a, yes. a niche community to serve. Like first. nailing, you know, getting, getting it really right. Um, and, 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 and I think like not trying to be everything for everyone in the mm -hmm. beginning, but it's, you know, it's getting that thing really, really right. And then pulling on the buyer use case to help you figure out how to expand the, the suite that you're building. Right. Do you think I'm people, kind of, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I'm kind of curious to share your perspective on this because when I think about, um, and this kind of goes back to like a broader point of almost like, user experience control like there's some arguments to be made that like you really want to try and push your users into doing things a very specific way and then there's other things rome might say was like the very very other end of the extreme which is like we want to open it up so that anybody could do anything any way that they want to and there's arguments to be made that like you kind of open yourself up to like it, it, it you can't as easily control the experience that way and things like that I'm, I'm curious like how most people think about focus versus you know sort of broad usability it really depends on the type of product that you're building. Like I personally, when I was at Pinterest, as an example, um, there were times when another p a product manager wanted to remove the ability of a user to do something. Um, and I'm never actually of that opinion. I think that what you want to do is you want to, you want to like let users do what they need to do or what they want to do. And you try to guide them to behaviors that you want. Um, but I, I don't like the idea of actually, if, if I, the, the example for Pinterest was being able to post an, an image, um, you know, th there's something that's kind of against what Pinterest is about when you have just an image because Pinterest is about bookmarks to a website, but if people want to do it, then like you should let them do it. Um, and you reinforce what the behavior is that you want, which is like, we're not going to put your picture of your dog in search because no one else is going to get value for that. But, um, but, I, but I, I don't think you want to, I, so I think you want to guide the behavior, but not like cut it off. I think like what Rome did is, you know, and I, I'm not an early user, but I think that they probably guided the behavior they wanted or, you know, the direction that they want users to go in by enabling the structure that they have with the backlinking and the, the trees. Um, and, and just kind of continue to iterate with that early customer in order to figure out what the next features are to build. And, and if it happens to work for more people, then all the better. Do you, do you have any examples? Um, Cause you mentioned Pinterest <clears throat> and I know you were, you're really early with, with that team. Um, do you have any examples? I guess my understanding is the thimble idea as it applies yeah. to Pinterest was a lot of mommy bloggers from yeah, the DIY Midwest. DIY bloggers. Okay. Lifestyle bloggers. Yeah. yeah. Lifestyle bloggers. Okay. From kind of Midwestern, right? Too. Yes. Was, was kind of a, at least what the lore says. Um, and I'd heard at one point early on that there was an attempt to try to broaden to an adjacent that would be able to touch a, a different demographic that may be more male oriented Men. Yeah. relative to what was the initial focus of the site. Do you have any, is there any experiences you can share from seeing that process or participating in sort of the attempts there. And I, I don't know if it, 
proved successful or unsuccessful or sort of you keep pushing well, at it or give up? It's such a great example of a couple things. So, so one, like if you think about Pinterest, a product, there's actually nothing gendered about it, right? Mm -hmm. What's gendered, what created this experience of Pinterest being gendered was that we did a really crappy job on the discovery problem in the beginning. And, and, and the way that happened is that if you as a new user, DK, at the early, early days of Pinterest signed up, well, sorry, let's start with it, the thimble was, was lifestyle bloggers. So you had all these lifestyle bloggers, women with, with audiences that were women, becoming like the early Pinterest users. And that was not what Pinterest started to be. It was, you know, a lucky thing that I can get into. But so you started to have all the, if you think about supply and demand, all the supply on Pinterest was lifestyle blogging content. Mm -hmm. Then I, as a woman, sign up for Pinterest and I automatically follow my Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. And I start to see their content, but because Pinterest started as more women, then I'm following more women. But if mm -hmm. you're a guy coming to Pinterest to sign up for the first time, and we automatically had you follow all your Facebook friends, you were going to end up following a lot more women. Yep. And it created this discovery problem, which was that we, we didn't do a good job matching men with the content that was relevant to them because you'd sign up. And you'd see all the things that your female friends on Facebook were posting onto Pinterest. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. So that created a mental model for people that Pinterest was for women. Mm. And, and one of the lessons is that when, you know, one of the user researchers would always say this, and it's so true, it's really easy to teach someone something new. It's really hard to get someone to relearn something. Mm -hmm. And once you already had a mental model of Pinterest being female oriented for a guy, it's, Oh, it's not for me. And mm -hmm. it takes, you know, it takes, it's kind of like, it just takes a really, really, really long time. Even though we had a lot of great content for men, we had to get them to unfollow the women that they were following. You know, there's like all these behaviors you had to do in order to fix that matching problem that, that you know i think we did and like it's not you know it's not as gender skewed by any means it's far more kind of equally by like uh it's equal more not i don't know if it's 100 percent, but it's far more but it took it was kind of turning the titanic you know yeah nadia jump in you had some really interesting comments on this stuff oh man there's like so much interesting stuff there but i think like sarah to your point it's super interesting how like you solve one problem in terms of like you know finding content and like friends for new users but then it like creates this sort of niche experience that like actually is not a niche platform but i think yeah. like going back to something you mentioned earlier around sort of consumer social and and different things that we're seeing emerge now and how there's sort of like a resurgence and sort of changes i'm curious like what have you seen or thought about in terms of like inclusive versus sort of exclusive social experiences? Because I think there've been, you know, some sort of like super successful things like Clubhouse. There've been some interesting seeming failures like Quibi's. Like what, what do you sort of think about all of that? It's so interesting the words inclusive and inc exclusive here because Another way of saying exclusive is a constrained market, you know, that's a thimble. Like it's, you know, that's another way, like I, any, you have to, like there are, there are a lot of companies right now that are trying to beat Clubhouse, right? Um, and one of the angles that, they, that they're saying is, okay, well, Clubhouse has focused on this very exclusive group of techies and they're being very precious about it and they're, you know, growing slowly. But so we're just going to be the inclusive clubhouse and we're going to launch and we're going to have anybody can join clubhouse. But the challenge is, is you do that and, and you're going to have a matching problem where like you're, you're trying to be, that's, that's the equivalent of chasing GMV uh, in my kind of marketplace, because you're right. trying, you're thinking you're going to go big and you're going to make it good for everybody, but you're not, you, it, it's the matching problem. is so hard for this type of experience that you actually, I think you really do have to start very, very exclusively in a very, very constrained problem. It's, it's even more like to get a synchronous live experience to work is so hard. And, and 
the cost of that time is so high that you really, really, really have to get that match to be really good. And so if you try to go big in the beginning, you, you won't. And the only way to get to inclusive is to start with exclusive. I on that note, uh, as, a, as an early operator or on the flip side, as an investor, when you're evaluating a market, do you have a sort of a general mental model for evaluating a market's like structural characteristics for what the right thimble is to start? Or does it tend to be too context specific and uncertain at the outside to, at the outset to have like a explicit generalized approach that's so more about finding the right founder to thimble or market fit or in, in a team that will operate the sequencing correctly? It's a great question. I, I um, in my marketplace and I could, I, I don't, um, um, like I had those six things that stop from uh, tipping a market. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna show off here for a second. Did that, is it working? Oh, you, are you showing your, let me make sure that you're set up in the right uh, role. I'm going to make you a co-host, which I think will enable you to share. Ooh, look at that. Oh, but it's flipped. It's mirrored right now, isn't it? Oh, it looks fine to us. Not all. Oh, it looks fine to you? Okay. Yep. Okay. This is the, um, that new uh, mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love Phil. He's That's super so, cool. like amazing. So I figured I was like, uh, at the, but, yeah. um, but so what I talk about here, which is the, sorry, I'm trying to make it look a little bit better. Um, like not all markets are susceptible to tipping. Like when I meet with a company and I'm thinking about the opportunity, the big thing that I kind of work through is, is these, is these like things that the founders, you know, it's almost like you want to create, you want to build your building on fertile, you know, on good ground, on a solid foundation. And so what are the things that will stop it from being a solid foundation? And it's, you know, just the competitive, I mean, I, I'm happy to dig in on any of these, but the competitive landscape, like if there's, it's, you know, it's much, if building a marketplace is about being much better than your competition, then if your competition's really crappy, you're going to have a much easier time, you know, or if like, there's no competition because no one's paying attention to it. Like much better time. Fragmentation's classic. Like it doesn't matter how good you are as a founder. If you don't, if you have a like highly concentrated supply or demand side, like you just, you're not going to be able to tip the market. Like, I mean, I can go into these, but these are, these are all things that I think about, you know, homogeneity is a big one um, of the buyer need. Like, just because it, it creates an asymptote for your network effect. So these are all things where uh, I would think a lot about um, at, when I'm evaluating a company and certainly uh, push the founder on. I had, I had a question about some, I really, I really liked the six uh, hurdles. Um, and there was a couple that I, I had some comments on that I was trying to think through cool. and things like when I think about the, I think it was number to maybe the low fragmentation. Um, one of the things that was interesting is I've been thinking a lot about uh, Spotify's business model and it feels a little mm -hmm. bit like, you know, there's arguments we made about there's a bunch of different stakeholders at play, but it almost feels like at its core, you really do have a big fragmentation of artists and audience members. But the thing that makes it, I think, a little bit difficult for them is that they have this, um, these sort of like middle uh, layers already with the labels and it feels like that yes. sort of like decreases, you know, like there's a little bit of that aggregation because of them. And so that makes it less strong. I, I was curious to get your perspective on that. I love the, I love it's, you know, I, I never um, got to see the pitch for Spotify, but I wonder how long, you know, you've got to imagine that the long, long pitch was eventually we're going to, you know, take out the middleman and we're going to, create a super, super highly fragmented uh, ecosystem that brings more value to the artists. Like you could, I would just think that, um, but you're right that like, there is probably, there's a long, long time for Spotify where they were, you know, they had to, they, they couldn't tip the market. They couldn't get enough leverage. Um, I mean, I think it was Facebook that helped them actually. They used 
they use an incumbent Facebook to get distribution that created leverage um, against the the record labels. But um, but you know, it's there's there there is a like a 3D chess game there because of exactly I think it was Kyle who said the question. Um, yeah, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For, because of exactly what you articulated, and then what you can see that one of the things, and then Netflix has you know done this too. Um, but one of the things that they Spotify has been con constantly on the on the on kind of pushing is about increasing the fragmentation on their supply side. You know, by yeah. by podcasting and other and other like bringing on other sources of content. I don't know if this question has evolved, but I can just read out the question that uh, he posted before, which is basically, he said, how important do you think community is for these emerging marketplaces? Mm -hmm. uh, community, I mean, I just lost the question. Here we go. That's a distinct ingredient rather than yeah. generally. Boris, what do you think? Yeah, I think we've, we've been thinking a lot about it and, and, uh, it's funny, it's like even somebody said, you know, going forward, even SaaS startups and, and especially uh, open source community, uh, open source platforms, if the product is equal, the community will drive the, the, ultimate, the ultimate outcome. I think that mm -hmm. the, the challenge around community and marketplace is always a little bit that I think nobody has really figured it out, like some of the you know, more social shopping marketplaces that came out of Asia. So I think in, in North America, it was always a little bit like separate and, and not really completely merged. And I think we haven't gotten the, the, the product right. But I think yeah. if, you, if you can get it right, it's a super differentiator. Um, Poshmark is yeah. the closest, you think? I don't know. It's like, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think... You know, one of the things that community makes me think about is trust. And obviously, like, you know, if, if um, you know, one of the things I talk about in, in the marketplace piece is removing friction. Um, you're like, you're con like, when you're building a marketplace, you're constantly removing friction. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a big part of uh, something that creates friction is a lack of trust. And, and Poshmark, you know, actually, when I looked at Poshmark, um, I thought it was a little confusing that you come into Poshmark and it's not exactly clear what I, as a user, should I do. Should I, should I like things and, and save things to my boards mm -hmm. and comment or should I buy things? But there is something about trust that that community facilitates that I didn't um, have enough of an appreciation for. I still think Poshmark is a little confusing, but, but, you, but there is something about the facilitation of trust um, that I do think, uh, you know, to Boris's point, no one has put a finger on exactly, but is is an element that to play with for a marketplace at least. But so it's, it's funny when you think about Airbnb is probably one of the the ones that has mm. a stronger community. You still don't feel it on the site. I mean, it's like yes, yes, like there's the interaction with the point. host, and it's like much much more social than and VRBO yeah. or home away, but. You don't really feel the community, perhaps among yeah. hosts, I don't know, but um, it, it, it's not like super, super strong on the site itself and the online experience. That's a great point. In this community a term, it seems they can get overloaded a lot where people sometimes mean community to mean people who all are densely connected already and come online together. And then sometimes people just mean like a really big top of funnel that ends up aggregating somewhere because of a new utility. And then mm. which is the stronger community? Having a lot of people and they kind of self-sort into who cares about the thing or taking sort right. of offline. Like I think the Airbnb experience, they started with offline trust that they established just, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, door-to-door, -door, taking photos and, and meeting people. Um, and that kind of offline trust they converted to online versus other tools, probably a lot of open source stuff started <laughs> very, you know, you know, kind of online, without kind of existing trust and sort of trust probably gets built over time. On Choi, actually, I had a really interesting point on, we've talked a bit about community a couple of times this call. John, you want to ask your question? Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for the, for the time. I think the question that I had was, you had an interesting point on how Clubhouse, when you talk about explosivity, it was really, can be seen as a constrained marketplace, but 
Um, I was wondering how you might kind of reconcile that point with Pinterest having trouble with uh, the initial user base having better discovery around female use cases and how that had like a feedback loop that started that was hard to retrain and how to think about, um, you know, what, what are the le learnings from each of those and how do you reconcile that into building a marketplace early on? I think, um, if, you know, when people are skeptical, well, so first of all, the discovery experience at Pinterest was really just the following feed. Our search was broken. Like, you know, there was, there was, it, it was just imagine a deterministic follow feed. And so that, you know, there was no algorithmic, uh, and, and, and it was even worse, which was that it was based on a, another graph, which was Facebook that then poured it over to Pinterest. So there was a lot of things actually, when you think about classic marketplace where that is some, a lot of brokenness. Um, and the thing that, you know, Clubhouse has a similar dimension actually, which is they're kind of taking a lot of the Twitter graph and, and bringing it onto Clubhouse. Um, but there is, you're right to raise the question. And it's one of the questions that people raise about Clubhouse, which is that it started in this kind of techie, you know, Silicon Valley insular universe, and will it be able to transcend that into something that is broader? And, and obviously we have a really good track record of doing that, you know, with Twitter and others, but, but, um, but there's a lot of, you know, counter examples too of things that just worked in San Francisco and then didn't scale. And so I think like what you see in terms of new entrance into the market is that it's the clubhouse for moms and the clubhouse for LA people and the club, you know, mm -hmm. like there, there are a lot of people who are trying to focus on different thimbles um, and seeing which one will have the best success of becoming something bigger. But of course it's not, it's not, it's not just about where you start. You know, there's a lot of things you have to get right. But, um, I, but I think I it's a good question. I wonder if there are examples like, you know, I don't I've not follow the history too much of hows, but my understanding is, early days, they looked a little more like Pinterest, but Pinterest kept very general and how got more vertical focused on kind of architects and home builders. Is, do you have any, anything to share kind of thoughts on the evolution there? I, my understanding is house was always focused on home decor and it just, you know, it was more expensive. Um, it was kind of higher end because it was the people, it was interior decorator led um, mm -hmm. and architect led on the supply side. Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually, you know, that's kind of the interesting, you know, that was their, their thimble was the higher end stuff, my understanding. Mm -hmm. um, very different starting point than kind of Midwestern right. lifestyle bloggers, you know? Right. And then do you just build around whatever it is that works or do you think were they pretty firmly, they recruited those people because they wanted to build a, a different kind of vertical focus thing? I don't know. And I've, okay. I, I maybe, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I just, but really you know, the name of the though. company is house. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I, I think uh, it was all, you know, the thing that the bigger evolution was when they added commerce as a big, as like a um, first class citizen mm -hmm. experience. Right, which is right. you know a really important part of their their revenue model. Are there areas that uh, that you are thinking about kind of for what's next or things that you're excited to dig into more or you know what are the questions that are top of mind for you these days? I I just think remote like the future of work remote work is probably the only thing I as an investor should be spending time on mm -hmm. right now. I think that the behavior change is so profound right. um, and. And, and, and it's not just like us techies, you know, it's very clear that we, you know, we used to work either in person or away and we're going to have increasingly hybrid experiences um, where we're going to have to figure out how to merge those two worlds and two different groups of people. Um, and so I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And then you also have got to think that there's going to be so many people who need to be retrained um, and also verticals that have, kind of been slow uh, tech adopters that are finally realizing that it's time for them to, to adopt, you know, to automate and to adopt technologies, productivity tools, et cetera. And so I'm fascinated by, by those categories. And do you, when you mentioned remote work, do you think about marketplaces in that area, like either infrastructure for, I don't know, payments and billing or talent or something that wraps all that together? Or? 
You know, it is interesting to think, actually, this is a point my partner Bill made, so I can't take credit for it, yeah. but it's, it's so true, which is like, it used to be that when you're hiring, like you want to hire for a, an engineer, um, you, your, your, your candidates was constrained geographically, right? But the, 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 the global maximum problem that you have now is there are engineers all over the world or, or even let's simplify like within a couple of time zones that are not in your candidate pool. There are not, you know, how, how do you find them? And, and, and you just take that across so many different dimensions. And like, there are, there are new marketplace problems that we haven't yet solved on, like we've, we've solved suboptimally that mm -hmm. I think are, is a real opportunity. I'm super excited about unbundling LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that there's, you know, I, I'm sure we all, it's like an incredibly strong network. I mean, the product, you know, you don't complain about more products um, <laughs> than LinkedIn in our, in our lives. Right. Uh, and yet it's suboptimal across so many different verticals. And I think for hiring, it's going to be, there's a real opportunity to replace it. Mm -hmm. And do you think it starts um, with kind of these these vertical or kind of focused thimbles? Like you do it for software so. engineers in a certain location, yes. or you you kind of bridge gaps, or more maybe more software engineers for remote work. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And or you know real estate developers or uh, not developers, uh, the brokers are. Yeah. You know, there's going to be you know there's going to be those little pockets where I think you can start there with really nailing that solution and then and then expand. Yeah. Well, I see we've we've hit about an hour, but I feel like once you start touching on the remote work thing, we could yes. go another whole hour. Oh, because... <laughs> it's such an amazing, crazy space right now. I don't know if you know no this. One... Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if you know this, but the highlighter team is has always been everywhere. We've we've never been focused in a single location. So even from day Are, one, we were just any tools that you're you're particularly liking to enable that? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the actual tooling is, um, you know, the basics you'd expect. So Slack and Zoom are, you know, very top of mind. Yeah. But I've, I feel like there's a bunch of new um, behaviors that we seek as a remote fully distributed team um, that we, you know, we're just now starting to figure out. And I think one of them is this kind of desire for a presence, you know, where mm. we're sort of have a sense of physically present the way that we all together right now feel like we're present. Um, but to do it in a way where you don't have an agenda and you just can hang yeah. out and tap people on the shoulder. And um, so we've actually been using zoom for that and it's, it's reasonably effective, but I think there are probably better ways to solve that. And I've started to see people poking around in that space. Uh, um, super interesting and important. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've, been liking that and then also yeah. there's stuff in um in sort of the people use discord rooms that oh way, yeah where you can just like be hanging out in a discord audio room and then someone like just swings by and says hello and i got you know oh yeah that type of yeah. stuff yeah yeah actually yeah we'll have to <laughs> we haven't we haven't played with discord for that but that's, oh you should that's totally good, try it yeah a good tool for that use case um yeah and then obviously the talent vetting there's super great talent all over the world, but actually finding yeah. and connecting is challenging. So there's different networks we, we work with for that. And then mm -hmm. there's, you know, the payments and the, and the contracts, you know, different jurisdictions and there's a lot, <laughs> a yeah. lot to handle there. So anyway, we could, we could certainly spend another hour on that, but, uh, but we've, we've, we had you from five to six. And so we're, we're at the end of the hour. So <laughs> I will, uh, I will keep to our schedule and we'll, we'll move to wrap up. Uh, cool. So yeah, I, I wanted to, you know, first just, Thank you, Sarah, for joining us for all the writing, for all the thinking on the space. Uh, it's great to get all of your experience in the room and be able to hear directly from you on these. So thank you. Oh, thanks for the great questions. Uh, we have several awesome town halls coming up. One is Bailey Richardson, who built the early Instagram community. She's coming on Thursday, so Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, and then Nadia Eggball, who is launching her new book, Working in Public, on launch date. Uh, which is August 4th, uh, which is next week. Uh, and Nikhil Basu Trivedi is going to round up our um, blogger centric, newsletter centric publisher. Uh, we're going to do that one next week as well. So we'll have, uh, we'll have the, the links in the chat. You can see Mishti shared and you can click on that if you want to RSVP for uh, Bailey's and uh, get together session. And then we'll, um, we'll uh, wrap with that. So thanks for coming and jamming with us tonight. And we'll see you Thursday for more conversation.